TFM. Welcome, boobers, to another episode of Warp 5, our dedicated Star Trek Enterprise podcast. I'm Christopher Jones, and with me, as always, is my esteemed co-host, Matthew Rushing. And Matthew, I am so glad you're finally here. It's really cold out here on the hull, and I got my legs stuck, so I'm hoping you can help me. Uh, okay, Chris, well, you're going to want to like just turn your foot a little bit to the left, and then back a little bit to the right and i mean hopefully that that should get you unstuck did that work isn't that what they call the hokey pokey maneuver (laughs) then you want to turn yourself (laughs) around because that's what it's all about (laughs) and that's how you get a mine off your hole you just turn it around and exactly and it's i don't know why they didn't think about that in this episode i mean maybe i mean it would have been a much shorter episode uh, so uh, much, you know, uh, I think that is the plot of a lower decks episode. <laughs> it does sound like something that Boimler would have to do, <laughs> right? I think so. <laughs> yes, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about the third episode of season two of Enterprise. This is Minefield. Here's a quick rundown. The Enterprise finds itself in the middle of a minefield. And there's one big problem. The mines are cloaked. There's also a second big problem. Some aliens calling themselves the Romulan Star Empire don't want them messing around with their invisible bombs. When a mine attaches itself to the hull, Reed heads out to detach it, only he becomes attached himself, and it looks like the end of the road for him. But this very bad, terrible, horrible day started much more simply. It started with breakfast. So, Matthew, why don't we start with breakfast, which is appropriate for me here in Tokyo, because it actually is 9 a.m. here. What did you think about the setup for this story? Well, and thankfully, Chris, you know, I'm up for a good Brenner for what time it is here. (laughs) So, I mean, let's do it. Um, You know, I thought that this was interesting, and it really goes to pretty much something that we've talked about Enterprise doing which is continuing the expansion on who these characters are and getting to know them more. And um, I, I think, you know, what I was fascinated was by this was that this is an episode that allows us to actually peel back the layers of who, not just the whole Reed and Archer relationship and all that kind of stuff, but really, I think this is the episode that lets us into Archer's thought process and why he captains the way he does and specifically with the way he interacts with the crew why he's more from you know familiar with them why he kind of fraternizes more with the crew than we've seen a lot of other captains do in this way and we get his rationale for that you know which I think is really interesting and fascinating because it answers a question to which, you know, many fans, I think, is even at this point of the series, you know, maybe didn't even realize they had in the back of their mind. But it just gives us further insight into the captain, which I think is great. So I love that this setup is helping us do that because it's actually going to be a thing that then plays out through the entire episode that Archer is kind of going to continually reveal some things about himself as to why he does what he does as captain especially when it comes to the relationships he has with the crew and to me that's really a great way to set this up and then of course this sets up the whole conundrum of why reed feels so uncomfortable in these type of situations Mm -hmm. and helps us understand, you know, why he didn't go into the Navy. And this is connecting all the way back to episodes from season one. So what's so nice about this whole episode is that it is connecting to a lot of different points from season one and kind of bringing them together here and giving us, you know, further exploration of these two characters specifically. And, and even just, I think, 
the crew in general. I mean, you know, Hoshi, we also see expand on it. So, like, this whole setup is is, is fantastic. I, mm-hmm. I love, to them having breakfast. I mean, and, 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 you know, I mean, Archer's so comfortable, and Reed is so uncomfortable. It's fantastic. Reed is very uncomfortable, <laughs> for sure. But yeah, Archer is too. I mean, Archer, he goes into it relaxed. But, you know, you've been in that situation where the other person is acting very awkward yes. or uncomfortable. And yes. then it makes you feel that way as well. And you don't know what to do. And I thought they both played that very well off of one another as mm-hmm. actors. It's a great point about Archer, because when I think about this episode, I primarily think about Reed and how it mm-hmm. lets us into his psyche and explains a lot about how Dominic Keating has been playing this character up to this point right. in ways where you notice this behavior and this demeanor, but you don't really know why. And I, mm-hmm. I'm not sure that all the details of his past life that come out in this episode is something that the actor knew all along because this right. came along and was written at the start of season two as a way of exploring Reed, in fact. Uh, but but not just exploring Reed, but exploring the relationship dynamic between Reed and the captain, contrasted mm-hmm. with the dynamic that the captain has with Trip, which is totally different. But yes, yeah. Before we talk about that aspect, though, yeah, I love that you did bring up how it informs us about Archer as a captain and the way he behaves, because from the very beginning. He obviously is a different kind of captain than we are accustomed to in Star Trek. And some fans, I recall back when this all first aired, some fans really didn't like Archer because they didn't like the way that Bakula was playing the character and felt he was too casual and he just didn't seem like a captain. And I always thought, well, it's very appropriate because he's the first captain to lead a mission like this. He's learning how to behave But here finding out that he actually had a commanding officer who was standoffish and put up that wall between himself and his crew. And that that is one of the reasons why he's more relaxed and friendlier with his crew really helps you understand the character a lot more and also shows that, yeah, he might be the first captain going out there, but he's actually given thought to how Mm -hmm. he should lead this group of people to be successful in a mission that's unlike anything that his predecessors Mm -hmm. or his uh, colleagues, uh, his peers have undertaken before. Yeah. I think that the beauty of that is, you know, there is a vast difference and Archer has thought about that fact that, you know, the style in which he is going to command with necessitates it being different because this mission is unlike any other. Not only that, is this mission so different, but he doesn't know how long this mission's going to last, right? right? This is not a five-year mission. They're out there for as long as Starfleet will let them be out there. And, you know, it's a small ship. Maybe they're um, out there as long as the Vulcans will let them be out there. <laughs> that, that's, there's that, That's too. how they feel anyway, uh, right? <laughs> right. So... In that, he does make that specific choice to be friendly with the crew, to get to know them, because he believes that this is actually going to be better for their mission. It's going to help them work together more successfully, and it's going to be even just, I think it it's not only going to be better for the crew, but it's going to be better for him, right? Like, if you were to keep yourself secluded really from the rest of the crew and only kind of interact with them on a very surface level basis for who knows maybe years how is that going to impact you right it it would be just the most lonely of jobs and so yeah yeah, you can do that when you're on mission together for three months you can't do that when you're on mission together for years right and i i love archer I mean, it, it just seems so smart to me. And and it and what's so fascinating is it does make it interesting then to shine a light on all the other captains as we kind of watch them do things. I mean, you know, obviously Kirk 
has, you know, kind of his smaller crew that mm-hmm. he really relies on. Picard has no one you know he might go to advice for people but yeah. he's not really like close to anyone yeah i was gonna Cisco's, say we we kind of see know. this a bit with picard where if beverly weren't there it mm-hmm. would have been a very lonely time because she's the only person we yeah. really see yeah. him spend much time with yep well and then you know cisco is is very different you know he 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 works to get close to um most of his command staff and and even people beyond that on the station. And then you have Janeway, who is very much like Archer in the end. She actually kind of ends up being most like Archer of, I think, all of them because, yeah, she's on this mission that she has no idea how long it's going to last. And so she does remove a lot of the boundaries from herself. I mean, she still has a few, obviously, you know, I mean, and I think her and Archer pretty much have the same one, which is, you know, they're not going to be sleeping with anybody on their crew. You know, they would find that inappropriate. Right. So, um, of course, even if they did have a, a connection with them. Yeah. So, of course, the uh, the monkey would be disappointed if Janeway didn't sleep with anyone on her crew. Well, you know, <laughs> the monkey, I mean, the monkey was the one who was blocking that actually happening. So, you know, check off. That's true. Yes. Chakotay has never forgiven yeah, that monkey. That's right. So Exactly. That's true. The monkey. Talking about having a monkey on your back. <laughs> the monkey <laughs> thought he was in for a show and he actually blocked <laughs> that from happening. Poor Chakotay. So anyway, yeah, it's a great example with Janeway being in a similar situation as Archer. Mm-hmm. And Archer's on a much smaller ship, so that makes it even more important for him to take a different approach to this. Well, and, it, and you know, I think with the Reed section of this, it's really interesting because, you know, Reed, you, you come to understand as well, you know, him coming from that kind of Royal British Navy stiff upper lip, British upbringing in stereotypical terms, right, can be less emotional. And you can definitely tell, and we've seen his family before, he has a very unemotional father. Oh, and he's yeah. he's kind of picked, yeah, you know, he's kind of picked up a lot of those habits. And so you put all that together, for him, this is an uncomfortable position to be in because... He wasn't ready to face his fears the way his uncle did. And so he decides to go to space. And I, you know, I, I think what what's fascinating then here is what this episode sets up is the ability then to see, okay, how is Reed going to move beyond this? And will he? Because of this episode, Mm -hmm. I I think that's what's great about, you know, watching them like we are. It really gives you the ability to kind of track the growth of these characters from episodes like this, because that I mean, with all the trappings, this episode is actually a character episode about Archer and Reed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's a bottle episode like Shuttle Pod one. We have Reed in here again. I actually noted that With on the slightly outline. slightly more effects. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But, <laughs> but the core of this story, what takes place on the whole, it's very similar to what happens with yeah. Reed yep. and Trip in Shuttle Pod 1. It's a great point, yeah. You know, the, the fact that Reed did not follow along his family's footsteps and he joined Starfleet instead... It allowed me to play a great game that I like to play when I rewatch old Star Trek called Reference Retcon. And in this one, you'll love this. There's a great Ted Lasso reference in here when Archer asks him, why join Starfleet? Why not carry on the family tradition? And Reed answers, God knows I've tried. And I thought, there we go. Got a a great (laughs) reference from the Ted Lasso theme song right there. (laughs) <laughs> yes, they they knew it was coming. They, they knew. They yeah. saw into the future. Future guy had told them that's what happened. Well, actually, you, you missed it. You need to watch more carefully, Matthew. It was just two episodes ago in Shockwave Part 2 when they were in the library. Crewman Daniels took him there. And right after the Romulan Star Empire book, Archer pulled one off and he opened it up and it said, classic sitcoms, Ted Lasso. From Apple Plus. From yeah. Apple Plus. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. 
was right there. Everybody's favorite book that hasn't come out yet. I can't wait to read that. <laughs> That's a section in the library. Everyone's favorite book that hasn't come out yet. Because <laughs> how many times in Star Trek have we heard people say, like like Cochrane in First Contact, you know, who said that? And Riker says, you did. Exactly. You know, it's it's always. Or, yeah. 30 years from now. Yeah, it's always, <laughs> yeah. you know. No one said that. I don't know of anyone who said that because it hasn't been said yet. Anyway, I, <laughs> we're off track I, here. I but. wanted to, before we left, you know, this conversation just about this whole thing, you know, we felt like Shuttlepod 1 was obviously really successful. It, it For both of us, it's one of our favorite episodes. Yeah. Do you feel like this episode was just as successful then in the Reed Archer relationship and kind of cracking that open? Not as much. Like, the structure is the same. I think that the situation, the difference in the situation makes it a bit less personal because they're in the spacesuits and they're out on the hall. And there was something more like one-on-one friends, uh, more pure. I think that's another key to it is that Malcolm and Trip are more like peers, whereas sure, here you've sure. got this dynamic between an officer and the mm-hmm. captain above him. Right. But the dialogue, right. especially the dialogue that lets us into Reed's mind, mm-hmm. I think works almost as well. It's not quite on the same level for me. But what it does is it reinforces what we saw in Shuttlepod 1, that Reed has this natural pessimism to him. And -hmm. and he... Yeah, I started to say I don't want to say this, but maybe it's true. I feel like he's willing to give up a lot more easily than most Starfleet Mm -hmm. officers. Yeah. And I don't... I still, at this point, watching this, don't exactly know why that is, although we get more explanation mm-hmm. here. The The scene, yeah. the one thing that really stood out to me this time that I've never really thought about before related to this is that when Archer goes back aboard the ship and he's talking to Trip about uh, other solutions, what can they do? You see that Trip is someone whose gears are always turning, where he's thinking about possibilities. Right, right. And Reed is not that person. Reed is very much mm-hmm. stuck in procedures. And yeah, that's something yeah. that we see from him in many stories. And here, it's also that way, like he is prone to look in one direction for one course mm-hmm. for a solution. And Trip is not like that. And I think that that's at the core of why the relationship between right. Archer and Trip is so different than the relationship between Archer and Reed, because Archer is also that person who is going to be looking for mm-hmm. other solutions. Yeah. And earlier in the episode, there's this very small, very quick moment that I feel like Jolene Blaylock played really, really well. That is the same situation where She tells Archer that the beacons were designed to penetrate Suliban cloaking devices. And then she immediately catches herself and says, I'll try shifting the phase variants. Because she also is focused on that Vulcan scientific route of, well, this is designed to do this, so it can only be used to do this. But I feel like she has adjusted to the way Archer thinks And she realized immediately that she shouldn't think that way. And then she says, okay, I'm going to try something else. Yeah, I think a couple of things. One, I think you're right in the sense that there is less personableness to this just because they're in the spacesuits. But I also think that that says something. And I'd be interested to know if the writer had that as an obstacle on purpose just because there is always going to kind of be a little bit of a wall between Reed and Archer. He's always going to kind of keep that there. Mm -hmm. And yet a lot does get stripped away in this episode in the sense that they at least understand one another better, right? Because they have had the conversation. So they kind of know where each other is coming from. 
I also, I think, you know, the, the idea that Reed kind of gives up more quickly than others, I, th- I think you pinpointed it in that Reed does get stuck in the, the idea maybe of glorious sacrifice, mm-hmm. you know, and the fact that he would die for his captain and everything, you know, I think for Reed that obviously immediately resonates with him and, and that he would feel like his life had had purpose and meaning and all those things. And I think, you know, Reed is somebody who also, I don't necessarily know has great self-worth, you know? So I feel like this, this situation makes him feel like he could add worth to his life by giving it for the captain. And then I a hundred percent agree with you that he is specifically is a character to which does get stuck in the fact that things work a specific way, which is very, that regimented, very military, you know, mindset, right? Whereas juxtapositioning that with what to Paul we saw, like you said, I think was fantastic. She's learning to think outside the box. Right. Yeah. Right. The way, in, in the sense of the way that we as humans do very much, you know, the best of us are ones that are, are learning to like, okay, yes, I know what this does, but okay, how could we do things differently, right? Is there a better way to do things, you know, and instead of just always doing things the way they've been done and which obviously is a, a kind of a Vulcan problem. They've continually moved slightly away from Surak's teaching and and then just put it on almost like, oh, that's just the way things have always been done and staying moving further away not really realizing it so all of that together i think it, there's just a lot of psychology going on in the episode which is great because again this whole episode is about characters growing and moving forward which is exactly what you want in this show especially in season two you want to take the foundation that you created in the first season and you want to build on that and a hundred percent they're actually building on that which makes it rewarding then as a viewer to not only watch it once but you know i find this episode to be rewarding again and again and again because you like you just pull out a bunch of little things that you know probably weren't there on your first watch of this episode when it first came out right that's that's a, that's really good writing and that yeah. that's that's rewarding for the viewer over and over again yeah well, and that happens when you have stories where the plots are so simple like this. You just put the characters in a situation. They have one problem to solve. And then you write a whole story you had around one that. one job! <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and you write a whole story around that. And so that allows you to focus on the characters. And, and if you're focusing on the characters and you have good dialogue, you can watch something over and over and pick up something you missed the first time, or watch something 5, 10, 20 years later, and based on the things that have happened in your life since the first time you watched it, you may receive the message totally differently. Mm-hmm. And right. I th- I, that happens in so many episodes. And I think here it happens too, for those of us as we get older, and then we can reflect on... Mm-hmm. the backgrounds and experiences of these two men yep. and and how that yeah. affects how they interact with one another. Yeah, no, I mean, 100%. And, and I think what's really cool is that, you know, we've we've talked for like 25 minutes just on one point, really, mm-hmm. which is these two characters and what this episode has kind of pulled out of both of them and the way it's affected other relationships on the show and everything. And I think that's beautiful. Just as a side point to all of this, we see Hoshi grow, right? Hoshi, I think, back in season one would have been in sick bay and would never have, one, tried to get back to the bridge, or two, be in sickbay because the doctor won't let her leave and make them bring her the recording so she can figure something out so that she, I mean, she's putting her life on the line, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, and her health and all that. She's willing to do that. Whereas 
in the first season, I don't think you would have seen Hoshi do that. So even though she's not in the episode of Ton, what we get to see from her is absolute character growth. You know, she is somebody who has become slightly more hardened in the sense to her suffering and works to overcome it specifically in this episode for the betterment of those that she serves with. So, you know, that's just one more place where this episode is rewarding you as a viewer if you've been, you know, watching from season one all the way into season two, you notice that you're like, oh, that's that's a difference for this character. Yeah, very good point. Character growth, even in small moments, in a simplistic plot. Yeah, excellent. Well, and I would say that's what's I mean, I remember. Uh, so John Mills and I uh, do aggressive negotiations and, and one of the things The very first episode we did of that show was Small Moments. Mm -hmm. That's your Star Wars podcast, by the way, for anyone who's Um, not familiar. And um, in that, I I think it's the small moments that can actually give you a ton of character growth if you're paying attention. And so that small moment here for Hoshi speaks volumes. And it's just... It's very good writing in the sense of being consistent. Okay, where was the character now? Where is uh, you know where is the character before? Where she, we want to be now? And using all those situations in that way is just it's just really nice. Uh, so I, I got to give it to him. Maybe I'm showing my hand a little bit, but I think the writers do a really good job in this episode. Well, while we're talking about Hoshi, let's use that to shift gears to the other big topic here, which is dancing around Romulans. And I don't mean, you know, doing the hokey pokey and other dances around Romulans, but rather dancing around the fact that they are in this episode and they're not supposed to be in Star Trek until Balance of Terror, at least as a first visual encounter. And so the writers have to find a way to work them in here. Now, originally... The writer of the episode, John Shaban, he was going to have another race, an, un- an unknown species, be the adversaries in this episode or the antagonists. And Brandon Braga said, hey, you know, this could be the Romulans. And he liked that idea. And they built it out here. And rewinding, 20 years. I remember when this first aired and a lot of uproar about, oh my gosh, how can the Romulans be in here? But I also remember intrigue among fans like myself, like, okay, how are they going to do this? How are they going to protect that view screen moment when we see Romulans for the first time in Balance of Terror? And what do you think about it? What do you think about using the Romulans here? in the beginning of the second season of Enterprise, and what do you think about the way they did it? I mean, <laughs> you know, it's funny. We just talked about the uh, latest episode of Strange New Worlds, and it's pretty much the same thing with the Gorn, right? It, this yep. is a thing that Star Trek likes to do, which is dance on that line. And again, I think this works much better than, say, the Ferengi in season one. I think this makes sense. One, because it gives you your first taste of the Romulans without it being the Romulans, you know, in the sense of like we never see them. We just see their ships and we know that they're a threat out there. And what's kind of interesting is that, you know, to Paul mentions that that this is they haven't been seen by even Vulcans. Right. Uh, She's familiar with the time. name. Yeah. I imagine on Vulcan you know, of course, there's yeah. knowledge of oh Romulans, mm-hmm. but they don't know much about them. But I, what I love is I think that this then actually helps later on in the series, especially when you get into season four and the Romulans kind of become the the big bad behind the scenes. And I think that's fantastic. And even here. We're planting a seed for where I'm sure this series wanted to go, which is most likely a Romulan war. Yeah. You know, so this just plants that very first seed. So to me, 
I have no issue with this. I think it's really well done. I think it's uh, the the writers. Um, Brandon Braga was actually one hundred percent right here. I think it actually works better than it just being another alien. And again, it's just that little that little seed that's going to grow into something big because the Romulans are going to become such a power point for the Enterprise series. Unfortunately, you know it won't play out all the way to the Romulan War that we knew of with the Treaty of Algernon, I think is the the treaty. Um, but that plays out in, in the literature. So, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like the fact that they used them because the series began with humans meeting Klingons for the first time. So if you're doing a prequel series, of course you need to be careful about what has been established already. And it's okay to write around that Mm-hmm. Just don't ignore it completely. And I think that so far they've done that pretty well with different species. Even the Ferengi you mentioned, you know, it's not a great episode for sure. But right. I also don't have a problem with them running into Ferengi because they still mm-hmm. don't really know who these aliens are. And of course, right. the Ferengi are out there somewhere. And the fact that our characters never say, oh, these are the Ferengi. They're into mm-hmm. commerce. They have laser whips and fur. And, you know, we never right. get into that kind of stuff with our characters. And so it's okay. So the idea that humans venturing out into deep space, very, very deep space, for the first time will encounter familiar races does make sense. So if you handle it well and you plant those seeds for future conflicts, then that's fine. And Yeah, as you point out, I think that this series was always leading to the Romulan War that we always heard about in Star Trek and that fans really wanted to see. Mm -hmm. And I think we probably would have gotten that in season five or six because they really are building towards that in season four with what's going on behind the scenes and at what point the conflict actually happens i don't know but they're building towards that and if they had that in mind from the beginning that maybe that's where we're gonna go because we know that there was this war it's a great Mm -hmm. idea to introduce the romulans early on like this in a way where our crew becomes familiar with their name doesn't see them does see some ships, but even T'Pol doesn't recognize the ships. So at this point, it's a different design. And I know that this is explained right. in the novels about what these ships were, you know, like prototype cloaking device ships and such. And so that's fine. I, I think they handled it quite well. And certainly, as you pointed out, it is a blueprint for how the Gorn have been handled on the strange new worlds so far which you know i think will be very interesting because with enterprise you could be working towards the romulan war with the gorn you don't really have anywhere to go because well, you're just working towards the, arena that's arena yeah, you're working but, towards you know, one that, episode yeah yeah but there's, you know, there's no, and and that's something that you can't even do really in your own show. So, you right. know, it'll be yeah. really interesting to see how they handle that. But here, I just, I thought it was great. So, yeah, this is, it's just one of those things where I feel like this is such a deftly written episode in all ways from the character work and then the way it handles the Romulans, you know, I'm, I'm actually really impressed especially rewatching it today i was just is was getting ready for this just wow this is they did a great job here so yeah yeah would you want to see an animated like a star wars clone wars type series focused on the romulan war maybe 10 episodes romulan war animated with oh my gosh. with our enterprise yeah. characters yeah you bring the actors yeah, back and voices, have them do yeah. the voices i don't I mean, absolutely. Uh, you know, we're never going to get that any other way. Uh, and so I would 100% love that, uh, anything like that. And I do think the beauty of the Clone Wars is it shows, you know, uh, and and Rebels has done the same thing for Dis- uh, Disney Animation for our 
for Star Wars animation, it shows you that animation can tell stories just as impactful, if not sometimes maybe even more so than mm-hmm. what you get in live action, right? Uh, if you do it well. I mean, gosh, the final four episodes of The Clone Wars are some of the, is one of the best Star Wars movies ever made. Um, it's so good. So, you know, you can 100% do that. And, and why not? before you lose somebody you know i yeah. mean yeah. the problem is is that our enterprise actors are only getting older and the thought of losing one of them is terrifying at this point but you just never know what's going to happen so if you're if you're even thinking about that yeah i'd 100 percent love it so i'm sure you would too i think it would have been a wonderful thing for them to do in honor of the 20th anniversary Mm-hmm. producing so yep. much content right now. Yep. You know, why not do something like that? Yep. So, yeah, it would have been great. So great. Okay. Well, this is a pretty quick one because the story is so straightforward. What are your final thoughts on this episode, Matthew? And what's your rating? Yeah, to me, uh, rewatching this episode, I was just very surprised how not only well it holds up, but how intriguing it is to continue to watch over and over again. Um, there was so much that, you know, we were able to dig into here with the character development. I just love it. You know, I would say this is four and a half out of five deck plates. Um, it's it's just a great episode and it does everything you want in a second season, which is it's building into characters from information we got in the first season and it's making them more interesting, more complex and more well-known to the audience. And for that, I give them very high marks. Well, same for me. I really enjoy this episode for the character development. And when I watch episodes like this one, I enjoy modern Star Trek, of course, and I even like Star Trek Discovery. But when I watch episodes like this one, I really miss that type of character development. We talked about Hoshi today, and even in those moments where we learn about Hoshi, just the time that they spend with that character is so much more than what we see in a lot of cases in modern Star Trek. And so I love that Strange New Worlds is recapturing that format, and I hope we see more of that along the way. We didn't talk about it today to avoid spoilers, and I won't go into any uh, details here because the episode Memento Mori that we have talked about a little bit here with the Gorn on Strange New Worlds just came out less than a week ago as we record this. So some people may not have watched it yet, and some people may not be able to watch it if they are in a country where they can't get access. But on our outline... So we do outlines for these podcasts, and usually I have a header, and then I write a little paragraph underneath each one about the topic. The longest one on this outline is a list of ways in which Memento Mori from Strange New Worlds mirrors this episode of Enterprise far beyond the Gorn-Romulan comparison. There are so many ways that these two episodes mirror each other. And so if you've watched Memento Mori, rewatch Minefield with that in mind and see what you think along the way. But great episode. I am going to give this one seven overly complex disarming mechanisms. Nice. (laughs) Well, you know, of course, those Romulans don't want to make it easy for you. (laughs) I'm just picturing that and it doesn't matter what species There's a group of engineers that sit around and say, okay, how complicated can we make this system so that if anyone is ever in a life or death situation, they'll have to go through these 47 steps to get out of it. Even (laughs) us. I'm thinking about, you know, in first contact when they have to go and, and, and detach the... Uh, the dish from the Enterprise. That's yes, yes. <laughs> the deflector dish. Uh, engineers, that's how they get their kicks. All right, everyone. We would love to hear your thoughts on Minefield. There are many ways for you to share those with us. Perhaps the best way is to go to Facebook and join the Babel Conference. That is our listeners group. If you're already a member, you know how it works. But if not, just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field, and it should come right on up. 
If not, just type the whole name, The Babel Conference. It is a closed group. It's designed to extend the conversation beyond the podcast. So if you're joining for the first time, please be sure to answer the questions and agree to the rules of the forum so that I can let you in. You can also send us email. Just go to our website, trek.fm slash contact. Use the form you find there. Choose to send to a show and choose Warp 5, and that will come to Matthew and me by email. And you can find us in social media on Instagram, Twitter, everywhere. Our username is trekfm. Now, Matthew, when you're not cooking up a great breakfast for Malcolm Reed, where can people find you? Well, uh, I love doing that, although Malcolm uh, is so hard to cook for because I don't know if he actually likes what I'm making him because he won't tell me. Uh, but when that's not happening, you can also find me all over social media under the name Matt Rushing 2 Twitter, Instagram, Letterbox, Vero, all of those places. Of course, I'm here on the network. We've got a, a, another side of the network. We don't talk about Star Trek. We talk about all those other fandoms we love in the 602 Club, so you can check that out. Uh, and then, of course, you know, Chris and I have mentioned here already many of the shows that uh, we're working on together, uh, and as well as I, Literary Treks, The Orb, Saddle Up, and The Artificial Tango. Literary Treks about the books and the comics of Star Trek. The Orb is about Star Trek Deep Space Nine. The Artificial Tango is about a Star Trek Picard. And then, of course, Saddle Up is about strange new worlds so we've got all that going on and then of course i also mentioned doing over on the nerd party network aggressive negotiations the star wars podcast with john mills and then i have a finished show over there with drea kaufman about harry potter called owl post but chris uh you know when you're not uh just trying out your ev suit and seeing what happens if uh, you have to go to the bathroom where can people find you <laughs> i am glad we got that bathroom <laughs> moment in this episode because I was just thinking, actually, Starfleet officers, they never, uh, the situation, no one ever says, I really have to pee right now. You yeah. just never hear that. It's so. true. It's true. <laughs> but, yeah. you, but you know, you know they do. No, when I'm not doing that, I'm busy scraping all the pineapple jam off the toast that I made for Malcolm's breakfast. I really wish Hoshi had told me <laughs> beforehand <laughs> And when that's done, you can find me, of course, doing all the shows with you that you mentioned. Also, Larry Nemechek and I do the Ready Room from time to time. There's Interphase, and you can find me in many episodes of many shows in the back catalog. So check those out if you'd like to hear more of my thoughts on Star Trek. And if you'd like to chat, I'd love to hear from you. You can find me in social media. My username is C. Brian Jones, the letter C and Brian with a Y. That's my username everywhere, but Twitter is where I'm most active, and I'd love to chat with you there. If you'd like to help us keep everything that we're doing here on the network going, we could definitely use your help. To find out how to get involved, just visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm. I'd like to send a huge thank you to everyone who is supporting us there right now. It does take a great deal of money to produce and distribute these podcasts, and we could not do it without your help. So thank you, everyone who is supporting us. And again, if you'd like to as well... Just visit patreon.com slash trekfm. Well, Matthew, I'm going to wash up, make sure that I'm super clean before we board that station next time on Dead Stop, because it's so pristine there, I just really don't want to mess the place up. Yeah, I mean, I'm always excited to visit a new place, so hopefully it goes well, so let's go. Let's go.